At this point, I'm just going to invite Dave Mitchell, who is uh, the senior leader of the Woodland Church family, um, uh, who is going to come and share from us to uh, continue our John series, uh, The Jesus We, we Need to Know. i going to hand over to you, Dave. Great to be with you at Highgrove. Sorry to be a bit late. We had an 8 o'clock service at Woody's and there was a few logistical things at the end. I brought with me my friend, um, colleague and housemate, Michael. And um, I'm going to ask in a moment or two, Michael, just to talk about just his experience of being born again. Because that's our theme today, actually. It's about what it means to be born again. Looking at John chapter 3, the story of Nicodemus and his meeting with Jesus. And if you know John's Gospel, you'll know that it's carefully constructed. John has taken his meditations on the life and teaching of Jesus and constructed for us seven um, signs, seven miracles, seven discourses, because for John, seven, that number of perfection, it's a way of crafting the perfect Jesus. These, here's what he taught, this is what he did, and there's enough, John says later on, you know, actually, Jesus did so many things that there's not enough room to record it in if all the books in all the world. But here's enough for you, those seven signs and the seven discourses. And we've got a little bit of that today as, as Jesus teaches us what it means to be born again. But I'm going to read from Matthew, uh, from Matthew, from John, chapter 3. And then I'm going to ask Michael just to come up and share a little bit with us. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council and he came to Jesus at night and said rabbi we know that you're a teacher who's come from God for no one could perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him and Jesus replied very truly I tell you no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again how can someone be born when they're old Nicodemus asked surely they cannot enter a second time into the mother's womb to be born Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it will be with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You're Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do, do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know. We testify what we've seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things. You don't believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake... In the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Michael. Thank you, Dave. It's good to be here with you all. Um, just give you a bit of an understanding of my background. I'm not from around these parts. Don't know if that's obvious. Um, but I want to give you a little bit of a sketch of what happened to me. Um, the very first time I encountered Jesus, um, I was a very angry young teenager. Um, I had been through some difficulties in uh, childhood and and especially going through a teenage phase there was a lot of brokenness that that happened in my family and um, as a result of that I was very deeply affected by that on uh, not just a mental level but on a on a spiritual level um, so I would say when I first encountered Jesus I was very obviously in my mind in a place of darkness um, and there was things in my life that reflected that darkness um, and of course, all of us before Christ are in a place of darkness. And that looks different for all of us. But um, for me, it was, um, I had, you know, kind of started in this pattern of alcoholism, um, you know, just very angry, very arrogant, um, very bitter and unkind to my parents. Um, and a, a, 
a light came in, in the form of, of a man um, who spoke to me in a way that was just so loving and understanding that it drew me in, and he invited me to church, and I went. And on the way there, I was mocking God, and I was mocking Christians, and then when I got there, um, something was happening to me. And it, it, it physically felt like somebody was reaching into my chest with an invisible hand and just gently squeezing my heart. That's the best way I can describe it to you. It was, un, it was supernatural, and I'd never experienced anything like that before. Um, and at the end of that experience, um, I knew that there was something undeniable about it, and so I sought something. I sought to understand more, and a pastor came and, and helped me understand, and that's when I started, started, started following Jesus. But that's not the only experience that I had with darkness. Um, I, I was in the military. Um, I served in the military. Um, I deployed to Afghanistan in 2009 as a scout in a light armor reconnaissance battalion, uh, which sounds a lot cooler than it actually was. But um, something changed for me in, in that time. Um, I experienced things that I wish nobody had to experience. Um, and I don't mind getting into it, but we don't have time. The, the main thing is... Um, I entered a second darkness um, as a result of that experience. And I lived with a spiritual moral wound. I, I talk about it as if it was a, a spiritual knife in my chest. Um, and, I, and I had this death grip on it. And I, and I wouldn't let anybody touch it. I wouldn't let anybody see it. I didn't want to think about it because it was so painful. The idea of anything touching it it was just unbearable, and so I kept it in my, in my spirit um, until Jesus came in a second time um, and, and drew me out of darkness. Um, and it was through biblical counseling, it was through therapy in a, in a sense, using the Bible to expose the lies that I had believed. But the important thing you, you need to understand about it is that my world... It, it, it was all leading up to this moment, but there was so many moments that led up to this moment um, of final freedom. And, and what needed to happen was the same thing that happened when I was a teenager, where I humbled myself and I allowed God to do a work in me. And I released my grip on the blade. And I know for a fact that it was Jesus that removed it. I don't know how I know. But I know from the bottom of my spirit to, to my mind, I know that Jesus Christ visited me and he set me free. My world went from grayscale darkness to color again. I went from feeling numb and feeling nothing to, to being able to feel love in my heart again, to feel joy in my heart again. And... I don't want to be the one to preach right now because I'll leave that to Dave, but there's just one thing I want to leave you with. Sometimes life brings us back into darkness. And the womb, right, the womb is a place of darkness, but it's also a place of safety. And there are things about the darkness that we desire. We want to stay there, but Jesus doesn't want us to stay there. So he's the one who draws us out. And I'm a little bit unique, but I'm not the only one who's had this experience of being drawn out twice. And I want to say that if you're going through a period of darkness, even if you know Jesus, he's not going to leave you there. He loves you too much to let you do that. So that's all I got. Light and darkness, those are big ideas for John, aren't they, in his gospel? In fact, we read at the start of this little passage, Nicodemus came at night. And maybe that's an indication that um, where Nicodemus is isn't just the, the, the night that says, well, I better not show I'm coming to Jesus because I'm a religious person, but maybe it actually speaks in his condition. He actually is in darkness and he needs to know the light. So what does it mean then to come out of the darkness of the womb, out of the place of... Um, limitation as well as safety, but into the light and to be born again. This 
uh, weekend. I've been up in London. I went up on Friday night to see my newest grandson, Louis Jago, who is my son Perrin and my daughter-in-law Emily's first baby. And, um, you know, honestly, that is lovely, but your babies, they are disruptive, aren't they? Have you noticed that? You know, gosh, they, they're awake all night. You want <laughs> very chilled in the daytime. Why are you awake all night? You're doing my head in. You know, um, they are, they're in charge, really, aren't they? And um, to be born again is to be disrupted. In fact, I would say the Spirit of God is a disruptor. In this discourse, Jesus says, uh, to, be, to be born, it's, it's like, the Spirit's like the wind. Of course, it's the same word in, in Greek or Hebrew. It's, it's the wind and breath and uh, the Spirit. But Jesus says, you know, the wind blows where it pleases. You hear its sound. You can't tell where it comes from, where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. We're probably going to hear a bit of wind this weekend if the weather forecast is to be, be, to be believed. And, and the wind, too, is disruptive, isn't it? Very disruptive. And I think the first thing to say about being born again is the work of being born again can be disruptive and messy, just like it is if a baby comes into a house. Again, I was looking at my um, the little flat where my son lives, and it's normally very pristine. It's kind of got stuff everywhere right now, you know? <laughs> clothing and changing mats and stuff. Disruptive, uh, messy. John Wimble always used to say, it's very neat and tidy in the graveyard. It's messy in the nursery because that's where the life is. So if we want to say uh, we must be born again, we have to say, Lord God, are you going to disrupt my life? Are you going to disrupt the kind of order that I found? Uh, the kind of little safe patterns, because actually what you want to do is expand me to take me beyond where I am. I think it's worth saying about being born again that, again, that a baby needs to learn. They're learning fast as a newborn. They really are. You know, the, the, you know the, their brain is um, absorbing so many new stimuli, and they're having to work. Well, what's this thing at the end of my arm? You know, whatever. You know, they're learning about everything. And uh, when we're born again, it doesn't mean to say that we've arrived. We have this spiritual life in us. But the reality is that people who are exploring faith in Jesus and following Jesus are going to be messy. And sometimes, as churches. We're a bit reluctant to welcome messy people into our nice, tidy churches. Uh, I've known churches that have locked the doors to stop the young people coming in because they are messy. Um, and Jesus, actually, when he's teaching about this, this life, this being born again, he sometimes compares it to new wine. And um, in Luke's Gospel, he says this, um, no one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they'll have... Torn, the new garment, the patch for the new will not match the old. No one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new. They say the old is better. The challenge is sometimes we say the old is better. We don't want to change. We don't want to accommodate the new life, the new challenges to our churches, to our way of doing things. And honestly, the 21st century is a time of profound change and disruption, convulsions in so many aspects of life. And for us as church, actually, welcoming what God is doing may mean that we have to do church differently too sometimes and not just try and hold on to our traditions, however much we've appreciated and benefited from them. But of course, new life is wonderful. It may be disruptive, it may be messy, but it is wonderful. And um, again, great to see my son and his wife in love with little Louie, little, little child in their midst. So, Nicodemus, who's watched The Chosen? He's there in The Chosen with his big beard. Yeah. Who is Nicodemus? Well, he's, he's a religious expert. He's part of the ruling elite. He's a teacher of the law. He needs new life. He needs disruption. He needs to forget all that he thinks he's known about how to enter the kingdom. You know, unless you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom, let alone enter it. You can't grasp it. It's about um, a complete reversal. Jesus is the, the, the king of the great reversal. And, and I, th I think it's, this is so important. You know, religious people are always trying to kind of be in control 
I, I'm afraid. <laughs> we are, you know? And, um, and so often we bring the ways of the world, the ways of control, the ways of power, the ways of intellect into our Christianity. And when we find it hard to accept this upside-down kingdom that Jesus brought into being, this kingdom where Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they will see God. Just like he said, blessed are the children, because theirs is the kingdom of God. It's, the kingdom is, it seems to be not about our power, our order, but about our vulnerability, our, our being willingness to let God be God, to let God be in charge, to let God shape things, for his agenda to be what we're following rather than ours. So it's a complete reversal, so dramatic that it's like being born all over again. And Nicodemus in um, John chapter 3, the religious ruler with his theology and his kind of, Jesus, you know, born again. What kind of idea is that? How can you enter into the mother's womb? He's, of course, um, John contrasts him so brilliantly with the lady in the next chapter, which I won't go into because that's next week's sermon. But the woman at the well, it's just worth saying they're opposites, aren't they? You know, on one hand, male religious leader, top Jew, on the other hand, female, Samaritan woman, broken, promiscuous or whatever, broken life, opposite end of the social status, both of them need Jesus. Both of them need to be born again if they're going to see the kingdom. Both of them have to have their theology blown away, whether it's Samaritan theology or good old Jewish legalism. And unless God does something miraculous, we won't be able to be part of his kingdom. We can't make it happen ourselves. It's mysterious. It's like the wind that blows where it will. And honestly, that's new life. It's mysterious, isn't it? This business of a baby being conceived and born, it's a mystery. We're not fully in control of it. You know, there's the stuff that happens for sure. But, you know, basically, God does the hard bits. And uh, every child is a gift from God. and Every child is unique and different. And we can't actually control how they're going to be. They are going to be who they are going to be. So how does this experience of coming out of darkness into the light, having moved from the grayscale to the full color, how does it happen? How does it come from being in this place of confinement to a place of freedom and exploration, from out of where we were to a place of the disruptive, energizing life of the kingdom of God? Well, it's about looking to him. Looking to Jesus. Jesus tells us, it might be a bit cryptic to you if you don't know your Old Testament very well, but he says, you know, just as um, Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes him may have eternal life in him. And that's a reference we can read about it in the book of Numbers. There was a time when there was a plague of snakes, uh, poisonous snakes, uh, on the wilderness journey. And um, People being bitten and being poisoned, and, and Moses is instructed to make a bronze serpent, put it on a pole. Everyone who looks at that serpent on the pole will be healed. And what he's referring to is this kind of thing, just as that happened then. Actually, when the Son of Man is lifted up, and I think he's referring to the cross, he's just a lifting up onto this stake of wood put there by the Romans carrying for us the sins and brokenness of the world. But as we look at him and recognize who he is, this is God, this is King Jesus, this is the upside-down nature of the kingdom, this is Jesus dealing with the sin of the world, not by obliterating things with a mighty army, but by absorbing into his own nature all that everyone has ever done to offend God or to sin against God. And he's doing it on my behalf. And as I look at him, as he bears my sins, my weaknesses, by his stripes I'm healed. He's carrying my sin. And I can say, as you carry that, Lord God, Jesus, I can now approach the throne of God, the Father, knowing that what awaits me there is not judgment but mercy. For God so loved the world that he sent his only Son, that whoever believes in him might be saved. God didn't come to condemn the world but to save the world. That's the message that we are left with. And um, 
that's what we're going to do right now, actually. We're going to look to the cross. We're going to have communion together. And you were, if you looked at Jesus and you said yes to him, you were bought with a price, brought into his kingdom. You can say, I, it was like I was born again. That's, that's what's happened to me. I have a new relationship now, a new status, a new family. I have a new potential. All of that stuff, it's brand new. There's no limits on who I'm going to be in, in God. And I'm part of his family and he's my father forever. That's a wonderful thing. But that sense of um, being born again and living for his kingdom is an ongoing reality for us. We're living it out of it. And, and today as we go into worship, again, as we look at communion, we look to the cross. As we take the bread, we remember the words that Jesus gave us when he said, take it, this is my body given for you. And as we take the, the grape juice, this is a cup of a new covenant poured out for you. This is, we, we say often, the body of Christ for you, the blood of Jesus for you. We remember what Jesus did. And as we remember, it gives us a chance, if as Michael said, we're in a place of darkness, that we can come back into the light because we can remember that Jesus has paid for it. Jesus carries it. Jesus went into the darkness so that we could be free to walk in the light. So let's just take a moment of quiet and give to God the things on our hearts and minds right now.